The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel as written to us by Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In recent weeks, we've been calling that quid pro quo thinking. That's the way most people think. But I say to you, offer no resistance to the one who is evil. Wow. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other as well. If anyone wants to go to law with you over your tunic, hand over your cloak as well. If anyone tries to press you into service for one mile, go to. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not turn your back on the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy, Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly Father. For he makes his son to rise on the good and the bad. He causes his reign to fall on the just and the unjust. If you just love those who love you, what's so good about that? The tax collectors do the same. If you greet just your own kind, your own brothers and sisters, what's unusual about that? Do not the pagans do the same? No, you must be totally compassionate as your heavenly Father is totally compassionate. This is the good news of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Okay. You're supposed to be saying, wow. Or as the president said at the prayer breakfast, I don't know if I agree with that. <laughs> he clearly does it. But it's not just him. Most of Christian history has not agreed with it. Uh, it's just too much. It's, uh, is, this, is he for real? Well, let's give a little context of history, how we created a whole Christian tradition that didn't take most of the Sermon on the Mount seriously. And that's where this is from which is the primary teaching of Jesus. Uh, in the first three centuries, uh, when we, we still were identified by and large with the underclass, with the poor, with the enslaved, members of the Roman Empire, with those who were oppressed, they had no trouble hearing this because their oppressors were very, very violent, and they didn't want to be like them. So they could hear it. But something happened in the year 313. And in the year 313, the Emperor Constantine made our religion, the Christian religion, the official religion of the Roman Empire. And in the next 25 years, 50 years, subsequently, we moved literally from the bottom of society to the top of society. We were in the catacombs, we were on the edges of town, now we move to the center of town, to the palaces. That's how we even got the word basilica. We have a, our own little basilica in Santa Fe, which is what we call the cathedral. But it literally means a king's or queen's palace. In other words, we changed class. In the first centuries, Christianity was by and large read and interpreted, and not entirely, 
but by the underclass. And then after 313, we are the powers that be. Before 313, there's no possibility that a Christian will fight in the Roman legions. Because of this kind of teaching, they took it for real. They took it seriously. By the year 400, just 75 years or so after this, you know what? The whole army is Christian. <laughs> and now we're killing the pagans. <laughs> so readings like this just probably, as you suspected right now, well, okay, come on, Jesus, be a realist. We don't live that. We don't believe that. We don't like that. Pray for your enemies. Love your enemies. But the whole thing hangs on this, that our love has to be like God's love for us. And God loves the good and the bad. Now, most of you weren't told that either, were you? You were told God only loves the good. Well, here it is. Check it out. If you think I'm making this up, go home and read Matthew 5. He makes his sun rise on the bad and the good. He causes his rain to fall on the just and the unjust. In other words, all of creation are the children of God. This is much of the point of my, my last book on the universal Christ. And then... If you love those who love you, what recompense should you have? There's no big deal about loving other Hispanic Catholics of the middle class in the South Valley. Um, of course, that's easy. Well, e even that isn't very easy. <laughs> we have a hard time loving our own anymore. He says, don't the tax collectors do the same? Now, of course, the word tax collector is a synonym for oppressors who collect the money of the poor and send it back to the Roman capital in Rome. And I, maybe you were never told. I wasn't as a little Catholic boy in Kansas. I wasn't told that the reason we're called Roman Catholic is precisely because of that, that we were protected by the Roman Empire for the next thousand years. And we identified with the Roman Empire. So we became the Roman Catholics. Before that, we were just Catholics. And you could say those are contradictions in terms because Catholic means universal, Roman means based in one empire. We weren't universal anymore. We had a harder and harder time loving the outsider, the non-European, anybody who wasn't like us. And of course, it was your Spanish ancestors who gave you that understanding. It was my German ancestors who gave me the same. Most Europeans, um, you know, thought of it as the whole enchilada. But now I'm going to give you another historical date. And if you don't like history, it'll probably be boring. But the reason that happened was that in 1054, a few hundred years later, there were two empires, the Roman Empire and the Eastern Empire. Rome was called Latin Empire. Constantinople was called the Greek our Byzantine Empire. And in 1054, the Bishop of Rome, whom we call the Pope, excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople. That was nice. And then the Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicated the Bishop of Rome. And for the next thousand years, including the period of history that you and I grew up in, we never had the one holy undivided church. We lived in two separate worlds. The Latins never studied. The Greek fathers, the Greek fathers never understood or read the Western fathers, the Latin fathers. And that gave us just half of the piece of the pie. 
I think that's why we're hankering for reform or maturity or wholeness or whatever it might be today. And please hear this in the right way. I'm certainly not wanting to be critical of our Protestant brothers and sisters, but then when they come along in 1517, that's a third date you want to remember, they were trying to reform the Western half, the Roman Catholic Church, which is what most of us are. You know? But I guess if, if you're only responding to one half of the piece of the pie, you become one-fourth of the piece of the pie. Now, that doesn't make Protestants not good people, but they got into terrible, well, they led all of us, not knowing it, not intending to, into basically 500 years of religious fighting, fighting, fighting. Because neither of us believed this. It was a very argumentative Christianity that you were born into. And that was true of Orthodox, the East, Catholics, the West, and Protestants, who, although they were never told either, they are the children of Catholics. That's not to put them down. You can't hate your mother. And we're the mother of Protestantism, for good and for ill. Uh, unless you're, you're given that whole schema especially those three dates, you don't realize how we're all victims of history. And none of us have the whole picture. And we would do best to approach reality with humility instead of these continuing arguments that we're the best, we're the only ones that God loves, we're the only ones that are going to heaven. Now, thank God, we in the Roman Catholic Church had in the early 1960s the Second Vatican Council that forbade us to think that way. But it's been 50 years and we still have Catholics who think that way. Who think, well, they don't even know anything about most Orthodox. There aren't many of them in New Mexico. There's some, some very good ones I've met. And the Protestants are all heretics. Of course, when I gave retreats to Protestants, I guess you know, they think we're all heretics. Isn't that nice? <laughs> just calling names. It's like our politics today. It's just divisive, dualistic, name calling. There's no hope for the world if religion itself is this infantile is not capable of love. So I admit this is one of the most radical, if not the most radical, of all of Jesus' teaching. But we cannot go forward in history without admitting he really said it and he really meant it. Now, our word uh, that just emerged in the last 50 years to describe this approach to reality is nonviolence. But that word itself did not exist before the early 1950s. In English, or in German at least, I don't know if it did in Spanish, the, the concept of nonviolence did not exist. Uh, and so the word did not exist. We dealt with all problems violently. The way you, you get people to change is you hit them, you kill them, you torture them, you exclude them, you punish them, you eliminate them. Does that need any proving? We have not been known for nonviolence. The very way we came onto this continent and thoroughly, thoroughly mistreated the native peoples who were here first. Then built our initial economy on the backs of the slaves. And we can't deny that anymore. And those were Christian people who enslaved black people. How? How could you possibly justify that and think you're a follower of Jesus? How could you have read this 
and whipped a black person. Hmm? Well, we just ignored this. And that's not an overstatement. So we got a lot of growing up to do. And we are both, as I said, victims of this history, but we're, all, we're also the beneficiaries of this history that gives me the freedom to stand here today in front of you and talk this way and hold up the book. This isn't my idea, it's Jesus' idea. And if we don't want to follow Jesus, then forget it. But if you don't want to follow Jesus, don't keep coming here Sunday morning because it doesn't mean anything anymore. And when we look at this church right now, I'm not a counter, but there aren't many young people in this room. Most of you are my generation or a little behind. The young ones just don't believe it anymore, I'm sad to say. And you know I'm speaking the truth because your own children and your own grandchildren are not here anymore. They realize we so compromised the gospel that it's not worth believing. So don't let that happen to you. We believe in one God. <laughs> 